Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me on the second episode of Security Talk series. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about IBM Security X Force Threat Intelligence uh, Index 2023. And to discuss this with me, I have today Camille Singleton. Camille is a program director in the IBM Threat Intelligence uh, team for IBM X Force. Camille, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you so much for having me, Sarita. Excellent. All right. So uh, a little bit of statistics that I want to throw out um, before asking you any question, Camille, is uh, in the threat intelligence index in 2023, what we've seen is that phishing and vulnerability exploitation have uh, consistently ranked as the top two initial access vectors, uh, swapping first and second places. So we can clearly see that phishing accounted for 41% of the incidents. And for the audience, I will share a link of uh, the Threat Intel Index 2023, so you can look at the full report later on. But we can see that phishing accounted for 41% of the incident and vulnerability exploitation. It captured uh, for um, you know 2022 as exploitation of public-facing applications. Um, would you like to say something about this and maybe uh, give the audience a little bit of insight on you know what was happening there, Camille? Yeah, absolutely. So, and the statistic I think is especially interesting when you look at it within its historical context. So about four to five years ago, there were really three main ways that threat actors were getting into victim networks. So the first was vulnerability exploitation. Uh, the second was use of stolen credentials and the third was phishing attacks. And these were all roughly leading to 33% of the attacks that we were seeing. So they're all pretty equally equal in terms of how frequently threat actors were using them to get into networks. But then about three years ago, use of stolen credentials just kind of dropped off the radar. Threat actors simply weren't using it as an initial entry point anymore. I personally think that widespread implementation of multi-factor authentication had something to do with that. It made it much harder for threat actors to simply steal and use credentials. So then it was down to vulnerability exploitation and phishing. And two years ago, vulnerability exploitation was in the lead, probably because threat actors were exploiting the Citrix server vulnerability widely uh, and some other popular vulnerabilities as well. But then one year ago, uh, last year in 2022, when the report came out, phishing pulled into the lead. It was 41% last year as well. And uh, and this year it has maintained that lead and, and the lead has even increased. So of course this raises a few questions, You know, one of which is why vulnerability exploitation fell behind. And I know this year it's uh, exploitation of external facing applications. And that's in part because we uh, changed our definitions this year to more closely align to the MITRE attack framework. And maybe changing definitions changed some of our numbers a little bit, but I don't think significantly enough to really describe that the surge in phishing pulling ahead that we've seen. Um, so for this past year, I think um, it was largely because there were no huge opportunities for threat actors in the vulnerability exploitation space. So if in the future a vulnerability is found on a server or an application that is widely used by many different organizations globally, and if that vulnerability is difficult to patch or remediate, and I think all of those are something we saw with the Citrix server vulnerability, then we might see that vulnerability exploitation number go up again. Uh, but this past year, it, it wasn't a good year uh, to exploit vulnerabilities. Um, but at this point, you know, we should also talk about phishing, right? Why is phishing so high and why does it remain high? And, and really it's the oldest trick in the book, right? It's been around for decades. Everyone knows about this technique. Everyone knows you're not supposed to click on a suspicious link or an attachment. So why is this still around? Well, phishing remains a reliable infection vector and continues to be used by the best of the best threat actors out there. Because the truth is there is no absolute foolproof way to defend against phishing. 
MFA is a fairly strong defense against stolen credentials. A strong patch management program is a fairly strong defense against vulnerability exploitation. And even though there is security software that defends against phishing, even though user awareness trainer training can help decrease the success of phishing attacks, the truth is that these attacks prey on human weakness, on the way that our brains naturally operate. And it's really hard to defend against that. Some people are inclined to blame the workforce. You know, people just weren't so dumb. If they didn't click on malicious links or attachments, we wouldn't have this problem anymore. So, but the truth is, even for a very security conscious person who is very savvy when it comes to spotting fake emails, it is hard to identify as malicious some of the phishing emails out there. And now, with the assistance of ChatGPT and its impeccable grammar and ability to tailor messages to their recipients, my guess is it's only going to become more difficult. So, for sure, we need to keep up the fight against phishing. We need to keep using phishing software, keep training our workforces, and employ behavioral analytics to catch phishing malware as soon as it's installed before it can move further in a network. But this fight against phishing is going to last a long time, I think. We just haven't found the solution to fully defending against social engineering attacks that can trick even the best of us. That is that is so true, and I absolutely agree with you on that. And I speak to organizations on an everyday basis, like the C-levels and uh, board members, and and I I hear there's so much that they're doing, but still it continues to happen, you know, every single time. Um, I want I want to switch gears a little bit, uh, Camille, and um, check with you on some of the geographic trends that came out from the report. Would you like to share some of that with our audience today? Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is the second year in a row that Asia has been the top attacked geography. And last year, we theorized that the Olympics in Japan had something to do with it. This year, there were no Olympics in Japan, but Japan was still, again, the top attacked uh, country in Asia, and Asia was the top attacked geography. And the truth is, I don't think there's one clear reason for this, but I suspect that part of the explanation is simply attention to detail, attention to detail. So in some geographies, organizations are less likely to call in an incident response team unless something big has happened, a ransomware attack, a huge data theft, a business email compromise stealing millions of dollars. But in Asia and in Japan in particular, there's a lot of attention to detail, a lot of focus on the small attacks, a potential phishing incident, a potential insider threat, a potential case of free software leading to malware on a machine. And they're paying attention to all of these details, calling an incident response to assist, stopping potential attacks before they become big incidents such as ransomware. So on many levels, Asia being the top attacked continent is actually a good news story for Asia. It means they're doing their homework, they're doing things right, they're putting in the time and attention up front and dealing with things quickly before they become a huge incident. And one example of this is a flurry of Emotet attacks that hit Asia this fall. So Emotet is a Trojan, sometimes we refer to it as a backdoor. It's often delivered through automated phishing emails delivered by a bot, then it spreads like a worm through a network. Um, also of note is that Emotet is frequently used as an initial access point for ransomware. So Emotet operators gain initial access, then sell that access to ransomware affiliates who carry out the attacks from there. So this flurry of Emotet activity created a lot of work for companies in Asia last fall and increased the attack rate we were seeing. But by jumping on those attacks, acting quickly, eradicating Emotet and addressing its root cause, these Asian organizations were able to prevent a lot of ransomware attacks, and that is good news. That is definitely good news, and uh, it's interesting to see the way uh, things are moving as well when it comes to the different geographies and, you know, looking at how it's trending. Uh, I would really look forward to see what happens in the next few months. And when the next report comes out, uh, we need to see uh, probably, you know, look a little bit more carefully on how things change or whether they're going to remain the same as well. Um, Camille, um, tell us a little bit about some of the industry trends. I mean, we just looked at, uh, from a geographic uh, level, we looked at the trends, but tell us a little bit from an industry perspective, you know, what industry came on top? What are some of the industries that are on the top of the list for uh, this year's report? 
Yeah, so this was the second year in a row that manufacturing was the most attacked. For about five years in a row, finance and insurance was the number one most attacked industry, but then last year, manufacturing surged into the lead. And I think part of that is because manufacturing is a prime target for ransomware attacks. Every hour that manufacturing um, equipment is offline, a company is often losing millions of dollars, and that creates a lot of pressure on them to remediate the incident quickly. And, and sometimes that means just paying the ransom. Paying the ransom is less costly in the end than all the money they would lose uh, by having their manufacturing equipment offline. Um, so, so that's one reason that manufacturing is a prime target. Um, but it's important to realize that manufacturing is also a very large industry. There's a lot of companies that make stuff, the manufacture stuff. And, and so I think that might be part of the reason that those numbers are edging up as well. Okay, uh, interesting. And, and it's interesting to see uh, financial services as well in there. Um, just want to remind the users that last week I did a session with Mark Buckwell where we talked specifically about IBM Cloud for financial services. So please go and look at that episode to learn a little bit more about some security best practices for financial services as well. So Camille, we've uh, we've looked at a number of things. You know, the initial attack vectors. We looked at the geographic trends. We looked at uh, industry trends. Um, I'm sure the audience are now trying to think about what would be some of the recommendations. So from your perspective, as an expert in the threat intel field, would you like to share some recommendations that organizations, individuals can put in place to make sure that they have the best security culture, the best security posture, and they are doing the right thing? Absolutely. So I know at the beginning we talked about phishing, and I would absolutely say uh, you know, even though there's no foolproof defense against phishing, still highly recommend having phishing defense software in place, employing regular user training and checks, because those can go a long way. Uh, second, definitely implement multi-factor authentication on every remote access point into a network. This is a relatively simple measure, and it can give you a lot of bang for your buck in terms of repelling threat actors. Um, third, I do think the endpoint detection and response should be at the heart of any security program today. So implementing a strong EDR tool at IBM, we have Reacta as a tool, but there's a lot of great EDR uh, tools and companies out there. And then having a team that can ep expertly sift through that data in real time and react swiftly to remediate incidents as they arise. A fast reaction time really is key. And last, as part of that, having an incident response plan and testing that plan under pressure. And Saritha, I know both you and I know the benefits that can come from testing that plan in a cyber range. Um, having people come in and, and really considering what's in the realm of the possible in terms of experiencing a cyber attack and what you need to do to effectively respond to that attack as well. So have a plan. Test that plan, make sure everyone knows what the plan is and that you can execute it in a time of crisis. That sounds really some useful tips. So thank you so much, Camille, for sharing uh, some insights, also sharing best practices and recommendations to organizations and individuals. Hopefully uh, the audience you found this session uh, useful today. Hope this episode gave you lots more insights uh, about the threat intel insights and also the trends that's going on out there in the world. Camille, thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to speaking to you again in the near future. But for now, thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you so much, Sarita. All right. Thank you, everybody. I look forward to seeing you all again in the next episode next week. Bye for now.